Hello everybody and welcome to day two of the In His Name conference put on by Evangelion. Thank you all for joining us. This is super exciting and it's like very overwhelming right now. Um, we've just got more and more people um, signing up by the minute. Uh, just our emails are just constantly new subscription, new subscription, new subscription, new subscription. So just thank you all for joining us. We've got people from all over the world tuning in, obviously New Zealand. Australia, Philippines, the UK, the USA, Malaysia, Singapore. Uh, we've got heaps of people uh, signing in and it's not too late. So if you know somebody that wants to get involved, just tell them to sign up and uh, you know, join, join the party, join um, what we're doing here. Um, which brings me on to what we are doing here. This is uh, an Evangelion initiative, a, uh, an apostolate that myself, Adele and Lindsay started up about eight months ago. Uh, with the idea of bringing um, these uh, high quality speakers from all over the world to New Zealand to evangelize this nation, uh, to set a fire in the hearts of Catholics all over so that they can spread the gospel to those around them. And then those people can spread it to around them. And next thing we know, we've got a whole country of Catholics. We've got to dream big because uh, we're working with God here. Um, so that's what we're trying to get involved in. And if you want to get involved with more stuff that we're doing, we've got a website, evangelion.co.nz. We've got a podcast, we've got blogs. Go and check it out and uh, get involved. Uh, so uh, that's a bit about that. A few shout outs. We actually have uh, a number of watch parties going on. Uh, we've got uh, our very own Lindsay. She's doing a watch party in her house. Everyone give a wave. And then we've got... Um, St. Patrick's Panmure, they're doing a, a watch party in their church. And uh, our friend Josh in Wellington, is, um, he's doing a watch party. Please do let us know uh, where and who you're watching this with uh, on our Facebook group, In His Name Conference. On, um, so if you just look up the In His Name Conference on Facebook, just type in there, share where, you, where you're watching uh, and who you're watching with. Let's keep the uh, commu online community going. So yeah. Uh, I think that's all the uh, intro stuff. Um, we've got uh, Edward Shree here. Very excited to have you with us, uh, Dr. Shree. Um, if you guys follow us on Facebook, you would have seen that we had a, a live Facebook Live kind of interview uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so that was very exciting. Um, but uh, Dr. Shree, is, uh, he works with Focus um ministries he's got his own podcast all things catholic and uh he does a lot of work with perusia so you can uh, find out a lot more about him from those places he's uh, a systematic theologian which means he's a bit of a jack of all trades with theology so we're very blessed to have him with us uh, so i think just before we get into the talk we'll just say a quick prayer and uh then we'll hand over to you uh, dr shree is that okay Okay, so if you join me out in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God, we praise and thank you for this initiative. We praise and thank you for the work of our hands, for your providence. And we pray over Dr. Shree in this moment, and we pray that um, you give him the, uh, the words that we need to hear. You, uh, you have enabled him with a great mind and a great talent, and we, we thank you for this. And we ask you, Lord, that we all have open ears and open hearts, so that we may take these words with us wherever we go. We pray, uh, we pray for the intercession of our blessed mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dr. Shree, take it away. Thank you, thank you so much for, for having me. This is a great delight to be with you all. It's Saturday morning for all of you, and it's Friday afternoon for me here in Denver, Colorado. So I'm here in Denver, Colorado, near the mountains, the, the famous Rocky Mountains here in the United States. And uh, I, I hope I, I one day I can make it to your great country. I was invited to come a year ago. I was just sharing with the Evangelion team. Uh, I was plan Every year I go out to Australia and do a little speaking tour there. And there was a group in New Zealand that invited me to come and we were back and forth really hoping it could work out, but it just, it just didn't work in the schedule, the short time I had to be away from home at that time. But I, I hope we can work it out that I can come in person, but thanks be to God for the technology that we have, uh, that we can still be connected at least in this way. So 
a uh, little bit about myself before we get started. So as, as was mentioned, so I'm a theologian, but, uh, and I've written a lot of books and things. I love teaching about the Catholic faith, but my real heart is all, all about evangelization and how do we share our faith? How do we live it deeply so that we can be witnesses to sharing the love of Jesus Christ and the truth of our Catholic church with others, especially in the, the crazy environment we live in, in a secular culture. Uh, and that's what I've been asked to talk about today, is how do we really live a vibrant faith in the midst of a secular culture? So to start off, I wanna talk about something very important. I wanna talk about gardening. Are you ready? I wanna talk about gardening. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if any of you are gardeners, but I wanna tell you something, my, my mom, is an amazing gardener. My mom is from Italy. She grew up in Tuscany and uh, she came over to the United States to Chicago after World War II. And so when I grew up uh, in the Chicago area, we had a beautiful backyard. It was like little Italy in my backyard. We had beautiful flowers coming up all seasons of the year. We had fresh fruits and vegetables. It was just, it was amazing. But there's one very important lesson about gardening that I've learned over the years. A very important lesson. Gardening is not genetic. Gardening is not genetic. My mom is really good at gardening and I'm really good at killing things. She is a, well, we, in the United States, I don't know if you have this expression, we call it a green thumb, like when you're good at gardening. Well, if my mom's a green thumb, I'm a black thumb, <laughs> you know, so I'm really bad. I, and when I moved to Colorado, I moved with my family about 14 years ago, my next door neighbor, he was like my mom. He was an amazing gardener. He had all these fresh fruits and vegetables, plants, flowers, it was amazing. And on the edge of our property line, there were some plants that grew underneath the fence and were popping up on my side. And so I asked my neighbor, I said, tell me about these plants, you know, what, what, what are these? And I'm thinking, I wonder what I have to do. <laughs> and he says, they're, they're, those, oh, those are raspberry plants. And when, as soon as he said raspberry plants, my heart sank and I thought, oh no, what am I gonna have to do to take care of them? I'll probably end up killing them. And, and he says, oh no, it's really okay. The raspberry plants, they're really hardy. You don't need to do anything. They'll take care of themselves. And I thought, cool, that's my kind of plant. <laughs> so that first summer, our family really enjoyed those raspberry plants. My little kids were out there. They were giving me daily reports. Dad, dad, there's little berries coming. Dad, the berries are changing colors. Dad, they're ripe now. Dad, we're eating the berries. Thank you so much, dad, for all these raspberries. And I thought, shucks, I'm such a good gardener. <laughs> well, that first summer we enjoyed those raspberries, but the next summer was different. You see, my neighbor moved away and he wasn't there for me to ask my gardening questions. I still had my raspberry plants and they were growing, but it was, a, it was a really hot and dry summer here in Colorado. We had a big drought. And so we weren't getting any rain. And by the time I got into the middle of the summer, I realized my, my plants aren't doing well. They don't look healthy. So I figured they must need some water, right? I didn't have to water them the year before. I thought, well, this year I have to water them. So I started going out every morning before work to water my raspberry plants. But that didn't help. I did that for a couple of weeks and my plants are still struggling. I can tell they're starting to wilt and I'm wondering what's happening. And I thought they must need a lot of water. And so I started what I called my, my double a day water treatment plan. Got up in the morning before work, watered my plants, watered them when I came home after work in the evening. And I did that for another week or so. And my plants are still struggling. They're starting to turn brown around the edges of the leaves and they're wilting. And, I'm thinking, what's going on with my raspberry plants? I'm giving them water. Well, one night when I was watering, I suddenly saw what the real problem was. My plants needed water. It was good that I was watering them, but there was something attacking my plants and I had no idea until that night. What I saw was something in the United States, we call it bindweed. I don't know if you have bindweed down there in New Zealand, but I'll describe this weed. Uh, Jesus describes this weed. Do you remember in that parable, he tells about the weed that chokes the plant? <laughs> Do you have weeds that chokes plants down there? Well, that's what I saw. I, literally, I saw this whole network, these, these weeds all around my raspberry plants, wrapping themselves around the plants. Literally, you see them choking the life out of my raspberry plants. And here I was thinking, I, I just need to give them water. And they needed the water, but they needed more. They needed me to be protective of the weeds that were choking 
the plants. Now, I'm sharing this story with you because as I'm blessed to travel all around the United States and all over the world, in the Western world, I meet people from Catholic parishes, Catholic schools, Catholic dioceses, so various Catholic teachers, leaders, and I hear the same kind of story. I hear people say things like, you know, this family used to come to church, but now we don't see them anymore. And the pastor's wondering, why, why aren't they coming anymore? You know, these people over here, they, you know, they were really involved. And now we don't even see them come to mass on Sunday. What, what, what's happening? We gave them the faith. I hear this, especially about RCIA. And I don't know what RCIA is like in your country, but I'm going to tell you in the United States, it's been a train wreck for 20 years. It's getting better but it's been a train wreck. The United States bishops did a study on the effectiveness of RCIA a number of years ago. And you know what they found? One out of three people who go through RCIA, who go through this whole process of entering the Catholic church, one out of three stop practicing their faith within three to five years. They don't even go to church on Sunday. One out of three. And, and RCIA leaders are wondering, well, what is happening? We're giving them the faith. Why, why is it not sticking like it used to? I hear this sad story more from parents and grandparents. I hear people say things like, you know, we raised our kids Catholic. We gave them the faith. You know, we, we, we sent them to Catholic schools or they got first communion, they got confirmed. But then something happened when they started getting older, like they got into, you know, their teenage years, they may be 17, 18 years old and they start wondering, you know, why, why do I need a church? Why do I need a church? I mean, I, I'm a good person. I believe in God. I'm spiritual. I don't need to be religious, but I'm spiritual. I have good values. Why do I need a church? Why do I need to go to church, mom? And mom and dad are wondering, what happened? We, we, we gave them the faith. And then the kid goes off to university. And then maybe he comes, comes back home for one of the breaks. And everyone's sitting around the dining room table over dinner and maybe some hot button moral issue comes up, like the definition of marriage, you know, or abortion. And all of a sudden, this Catholic young man says, well, I mean, I wouldn't live like that. But if somebody else wants to, you know, maybe it's okay for them. You know, I, I, I mean, we shouldn't be so judgmental. I mean, everyone should be able to make up their own morality. Why is the Catholic Church so intolerant, mom? And mom and dad are wondering, what happened? We, we, we gave them the faith. And then the young man in, graduates from university, he gets a job and he falls in love and they start living together and living together and living together. And finally mom and dad one day come up and tap him on the shoulder and says, hey son, have you ever thought about marriage? <laughs> and, and the son, it's as if he has an anaphylactic allergic reaction when he hears the M word of marriage. Man, whoa, marriage, what are you talking about? I mean, well, why do I need marriage? I mean, we like each other, we've got good jobs, we get along. Why do I need some certificate from some church? How many of you have heard stories like that? Raise your hands. Yeah, it happens in New Zealand, right? It's all over here, United States, Canada. I've seen it in England and Ireland, all over Europe. I've seen it in Dubai. I've seen it in Australia, all over the world. And anywhere that, that's been influenced by the Western world, there is this new environment we're in where it's not enough to give the faith. It's not enough today. It's not enough for my plants to just get water. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to give the faith. We absolutely have to do that. <clears throat> I'm just saying... We have to do so much more for our own faith life and so much more for the people we love than just give them the faith. We have to do a lot more than give my plants water. My plants needed me to be mindful of the weeds that are attacking. And we have to realize that in the culture we're living in, the secular culture has many weeds that choke the life out of our own faith life. And if we're not careful what we take in, what we watch, what we listen to, how we spend our time, what we value, if we're not careful, we're not discerning, those cultural weeds will choke our own faith life and the faith life of the people we love. You see, the culture we live in, we call it a secular culture, and that often means it's, it's not religious. But I want us to see that not religious doesn't mean, you know, it's, it, it, it's neutral. Like, I think that's what sometimes people think, oh, it's secular. I wish there was more Christian values, but 
at least it's neutral. It's just secular. And I want you to know secular culture is not neutral. It is not like Switzerland. It is not neutral. Secular culture has its own worldview, its own views of life, what is love, what's the meaning of life, what makes us happy, what is beauty, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what, what is success, what happens after we die. The secular world has lots of strong opinions about those things, and they're very aggressive, very evangelical. The most evangelical movement right now in the world is the secular culture. They're evangelizing us from a very young age, trying to get us to buy their view of what love is, their view of what marriage is, their view of what makes us happy. And if we're not careful, these weeds will choke our own faith life. So I'm blessed with our children. And I, um, I, I know that I have to do more than just pass on the faith to my kids. If that's all I do. If, if my kids come away knowing that there's you know, one God, three persons of the Trinity, seven sacraments, 10 commandments, 12 apostles. If that's all I do for them, they're gonna have zero chance of that, their faith surviving in the secular environment in which we're living because they're gonna face those weeds. I need to prepare them for those weeds. You need to prepare your heart for those weeds or your faith life will be choked. So uh, I like to think of it as like, you know, everyone's talking about an, you know, some kind of drug that's going to fight the coronavirus. You know, we've got to get immunized. And we talk all about immunizations. We get immunizations when we're really young. But, you know, the idea of an immunization is that it shows the body a sample of a disease it might encounter someday. So then your body, when it encounters the real disease, it knows how to attack it. Are you spiritually immunized? Do you spiritually immunize the people you love, your children, the next generation? We do this for our bodies, but do you prepare yourself and those you love for what they're going to face in the culture around us. Now, in our short time, I'm only going to be able to talk about a couple of uh, a couple of these topics. What I'm really drawing from is this book that I wrote called Love Unveiled, The Catholic Faith Explained. I'm holding up the uh, the Australian edition. <laughs> so uh, this is published, uh, Charbel Reish, many of you know him. He's, I think, kicked off the conference here um, with Perusia Media there in Sydney. Uh, and I, I believe Evangelion has a relationship with them. So all I'm going to be talking about is, is from this book, which is a walk through the Catholic faith in light of the questions people have today. It's walking through our faith in light of all those cultural weeds so that we can be aware of them for our own souls and for the, the souls of those we love. So I'm, I, I, I talk about dozens of these kinds of topics, dozens of these kinds of weeds here. I'm going to talk about just one or two of them tonight. First of all, you ready? We're going to just jump right in. I want to talk about one really basic thing. What is love? What is love? I know that sounds really basic, but if you don't get the most basic things right, you can end up with a lot of trouble. <laughs> and, and, and we don't get love right in our culture. And we're not going to get anything right. Because uh, according to the Bible, who is God? First John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. God is love. So if I, if I get love just a little bit off, it's going to lead to a disaster. It's kind of like the number pi. We did a big, like, fun game right now, and I said, who could, who could spell out the number pi for me to the farthest degree? 3.14159, that's about as far as I can go. But let's say I just said pi was just, I'm going to round up. Pi is 3.2. Pi is 3.2. And let's say in your town, there was a, I was, your, I was the engineer coming to your town to build a bridge, and I'm just going to round pi up to 3.2. And I build the bridge based on pi as 3.2. It's just a little bit off. It's not that big of a deal. Would, would, would you get on that bridge? Would you drive over that bridge? No way. You know, if we don't get love right, and you're just a little bit off, you're going to have a lot of trouble in life. And that's why so many people end their dating relationships with such disappointment, disillusionment. That's why so many marriages fall apart because they, we don't get the most fundamental things right. You see, in our culture, when we use the word love in the secular culture, we use it for so many things, right? You know, we say things like, you know, I love pizza. You know, I love, I love football. Soccer, we call it in the United States. I'm a big, uh, you, you all call it football there in New Zealand? What do you call soccer? Messi, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, what do you call it there? I think it's football. It football. Football. Okay. Yeah. That's what the rest of the world does. All right. So I love football. I love Tottenham in the EPL. I love Barcelona in the Spanish Premier League. You know, so I, I, I use the word love like that, right? I love bacon. I love a good steak. I love coffee. 
So we use this word so loosely, right? So if I say, I love ice cream, I love bacon, I love Manchester United, and then I turn to my wife, Beth, and I say, Beth, and I love you too. What does that really mean? <laughs> you know, we use the word so loosely. I, I think what we mean when we say I love something, we mean, I think we mean you do something for me. You do something for me. I get something out of you. Right. Does anyone here love coffee? Just raise your hand. Any, any coffee lovers there? I love coffee. I love coffee. I love the smell of coffee. I love the taste of coffee. I love the sound of coffee percolating in the morning. Uh, I love holding a warm mug on a cold day. I love coffee. It does something for me. I love coffee. I, I love the taste. I love how it wakes me up in the morning, gets me ready to go. I love coffee. Anyone love a good steak? Anyone love steak? You all have steak down there in New Zealand, I know. Yeah, so you love a good steak. You know, I love a nice kind of steak, medium rare. Maybe in the United States, we put maybe like some sauteed onions on top or mushrooms. I just love a really good juicy steak. I love how it tastes. It satisfies my appetite. It satisfies my cravings. I love steak. So I love coffee. I love steak, but here's the deal. Once I'm done with my cup of coffee and once I'm done with my plate of steak, the love affair is over and I move on to the next thing that's going to do something for me. That's what we mean by love in our culture today. And, and what's so sad about that is when I take that view of love and I apply it to the people in my life, my friends and family, but especially a dating relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or I apply that to my spouse, it's gonna lead to a disaster. That's not just 3.2. That's like pi is like 7.9. It's way off. If I think love is you do something for me. I mean, th that's what the culture teaches us, right? I mean, think of all the love songs, all those love, uh, romantic love songs. It's all super emotional, right? It's like, I can't live without you. Yes, you can. You've lived 18 years without this person. You really can. You know, all I need is you. No, you need oxygen and water and many other things. Right? It, it, it's just so hyper sentimental about what love is. You know, in other words, what is love? You give me all these feelings. I get these romantic rushes of emotions. You do something for me. But what happens if you lost that love and feeling? Well, then, whoa, 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 the relationship's over and I leave you and I move on to the next thing, the next person that's going to do something for me and give me those emotions. That's how so many people live their dating relationships. There's a young gal uh, here in Colorado that once told a friend of mine that she, she always breaks up with her boyfriends at the four-month mark, four months. And my friend asked, well, what, what's it about four months? And she says, oh, because that's when the feelings go away. Yeah, the feelings always fade around four months and I really like those feelings. So I end the relationship to go find someone else who will give me those feelings. You do something for me. That's the view of love our culture is passing on. You do something. You make me feel not alone. I'm not alone anymore. You do something for me. Or Ed Sheeran love. Ed Sheeran love. I'm in love with your body and I'm in love with the shape of you. And though my heart's kind of in it too, it's really just about your body. He just comes out so crassly and says it. What is love? Love is, it's about your body is pleasant to look at. It's pleasant to touch. It gives me sexual satisfaction. You do something for me. Do you hear how self-centered the modern view of love is? You do something for me. Here's the real definition of love. Taken right out of the catechism of the Catholic Church, quoting the great St. Thomas Aquinas. To love is to will the good of the other. I want you all to say that. Many of you in the watch groups, can you say that? Love is to will the good of the other. Say it. Love is to will the good of the other. I want every Catholic to, to, to just know that, second nature. It's to will the good of the other. It's to seek what's best for other people. It's looking outward. Modern love, the modern view of secular love is you do something for me. What do I get out of you? And if I don't get anything out of you anymore, then I'm done and I move on to someone else. Deep in our hearts, we want someone that's gonna love us for who we are. They're committed to us. They're seeking what's best for us. That's what we want. I don't wanna just be used. Real love is modeled by Jesus Christ on the cross. When he's up there on the cross, he's not up there going, I love you, humanity. You make me feel so good. No, real, real love hurts sometimes. He lays down his life for us because he's willing the good of the other. He's seeking what's best for us. Now, I see there's a lot of young people here. 
I'm going to just ask the young folks or I'll ask everybody, how many of you have heard of theology of the body? Any of you heard of, a lot of you heard of theology of the body, I bet. Oh, great. You know, this it's, it's made it all the way, all the way down to New Zealand. Well, it's so fun in the United States. I, I, I wish I had theology of the body when I was growing up. I, I've, I've been blessed to teach it and write about it. And it's really fun. But I meet so many young people around the world that have been inspired by theology. Of the body. They want to live their relationships differently. I'm not going to follow the culture's view of love. You know, so you'll meet these young people that really are inspired by this. They want to live a good Christian kind of dating relationship and marriage. But even still, they still kind of still have a hyper emotional view of love, even though it's very Catholic. You know, so they'll say things like this, you know, no, we're, I'm going to follow theology of the body. I'm going to date the Catholic way. In fact, I'm not going to date. I'm going to do courtship with a capital C really serious, you know, and then they're going to get married. And they think like marriage is gonna be so awesome. You know, we're, we're, I'm going to be married and it's going to be Catholic. We're going to have Jesus at the center of our relationship. We're going to have a bunch of babies and it's going to be really Catholic and Jesus centered. And, but it's going to be so beautiful. And every night when we put our kids down, my spouse and I, we're going to sit by the fire together. We're going to hold hands and we're going to sip some good red wine and we're going to gaze into each other's eyes and we'll whisper sweet quotes from theology of the body to each other. It's going to be so special. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you married people? Some of you are married. Does your marriage look like that? Is that what your marriage look like? Okay, this is what marriage looks like in my household. Ready? I come home after a long day of work and there's a big mess on the table. My wife's getting the dinner finished at the kitchen. And I, and I get the kids to try to corral them to help clean off the table. Everyone, come on, let's clear out the table. Let's go set the table. No, no, you get over here. You two, come over here. Let's help. Okay, we set the table. So mom, bring the food out. Okay, ready? Bless us, oh Lord. And we do the prayer. Then we're serving. Okay, we're serving. Okay, and then um, uh, you, you, wanna, you, you, want, you want seconds. Okay, well, mom and dad haven't had first, but we'll give you seconds right now. Okay, oh, and you need a drink. Okay, let me go get a drink for you. Okay, here we go. Oh, you need a drink too. Well, that would have been helpful when I was up, but I'll go up again and get you a drink. Here you go. And then my wife and I are finally like cutting our food, getting ready to take a first bite. And inevitably this happens at least once a week. I don't know why this is such a big deal, but at least once a week, some kid always does this. They spill their cup. I don't know why that's so hard. It could be my four-year-old or my teenager. Somebody spills the cup and there's this big mess. Now, when it's a little kid spilling the cup, they spill their cup. What does that little kid do? Does anyone know what does that little kid do? No, he doesn't cry. No, no, you want the, you, the little kid, you know what the little kid does? He just stares. He just stares. We got, we got Niagara Falls waterfall of water all over the floor. And he's just like this. Get a towel. Come on, guys. Let's go get a towel. We got to clean this up. All right, let me finish the meal. We do a closing prayer. Now we got to do the chores. Let's do the chores. Okay. All right. Did you practice piano? All right, go get your math done. Everybody go get your bath, get your pajamas on. Okay. Um, could somebody give the baby a bath? That would be really helpful. Thank you. Oh, you need me to sign this for your teacher. Okay. All right. And then, oh, honey, oh, tomorrow for lunch. Yeah. We'll get you the lunch. Here you go. Oh, hey, um, the baby's running around naked. Could somebody clothe the naked, please? Uh, all right, everyone, go brush your teeth with toothpaste. Yes, with toothpaste. Okay, now we're going to get ready for bed. Okay, we're going to do a little closing prayer before we go to bed here. All right, children, mom and dad, you know, it's been a really long day, and we're exhausted. But it's now time for everyone to go to their rooms and go to bed. So I want you to go up and go to your rooms and stay in your bed. That, that, no, no, sweetie. That means you too. You need, you need to stay in your bed. Okay. Thank you. Wait, wait, no, sweetie. I said, go, go, stay in your bed. Okay. You got to stay in your bed. Thank you. Stay in your bed. <laughs> and I, after, you know, it's like 1030 at night and my wife and I kind of, we just kind of make it back to the sanctuary of our bedroom. We plop down on our beds, completely wiped out from the day. And I turned to her and I say, are you doing okay, honey? She says, yep. And I said, and she says, are you doing okay? And I say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging in there. And I say, okay, I love you. And she says, I love you. And I say, good night. And then she says, good night. And then we're done. That's love. That's love. <laughs> Real love is not gazing in each other's eyes like this. You make me feel so good. 
Real love is not so self-centered. That's secular love. Real love is not so self-centered. You make me feel so good. It's not about two people staring in each other's eyes, giving each other romantic feelings. That is not love. It's not self-centered. Real love is more husband and wife standing shoulder to shoulder, looking outward and serving something so much bigger than themselves. That's what real love is. It's looking outward. And this is what we need to talk about with the next generation because our world is bombarding us on social media, on the shows we watch, the music we listen to. Constantly, it's all about what you do for me. And we need to talk to the next generation about love. If we don't talk to them about love, you just need to know they're hearing many other voices teach them about love for dozens and dozens of hours a day. If you don't talk about love, they're going to hear other voices and that's what's going to shape their hearts. Now, do I have maybe like five more minutes to, to go, Dom? Does that work? I, I, I'll, can I just, I'll do one quick, one other point uh, I'll make. Is there truth? I think that's the second big question I want to have. Is there moral truth? Can we say that there are certain things that are right and wrong? Can we say there are certain things that are right all the time for everyone? Are there certain things that are wrong all the time for everyone? Can we say that? You know, um, I, I want to get after this here. Here's an, here's an expression I want us to say again. You can say this in your watch group. So I want you to say law equals love. Can you all say that? <laughs> okay. Why do I have you say that? Because love is the last thing people in our secular world think about when they hear about the moral law or the Catholic church's teachings or the biblical moral principles. Like the last thing they're thinking about is love. They think like, oh, that's just some random rule from your religion. And if you want to follow those random rules, that's fine for you. But, you know, don't impose your rules on me. You know, so the last thing they're thinking about is love. What we want to do is reframe the conversation in our own minds and for other people. That everything the Catholic Church teaches, everything, especially its moral teachings, is all about love. It's all about love. I don't care if we're talking about the human life issues that I know are really big right there right now, like abortion and euthanasia. I don't care if we're talking about care for the poor, the environment, or we're talking about the definition of marriage or premarital sex, whatever your favorite issue is, everything the Catholic Church teaches is all about love. It comes from the God who is love, who freely chose to bring you into existence. You didn't have to exist. He chose to bring you into existence. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to share his love with you. And, and, and he made us for this love. And, and, and he loves us so much, he showed us the way to experience more love and to give more love. He gave us the moral law. That's what the, love is, the law is all about. It's all about love. You see, I was just recently going for a, a hike with my, um, my teenage son. He wanted to go for a hike here in the Rocky Mountains. And he wanted to bring his little sisters along, his little sisters, Kiara and Eleanor, the six and four-year-old. And so after a Sunday mass, we drove up into the mountains. We went for a hike and it was a real fun hike. And he was carrying the backpack. And then all of a sudden, he just gets off the trail and he starts off-roading and he just wants to go exploring. And the little girls thought that was really cool. And I was like, okay, let's go. Next thing I know, we're starting to climb things and we're going up at like big inclines. And I'm taking the four-year-old and handing the four-year-old to him. I go, is this safe? Are we okay? We eventually make it up to like this summit and you got this spectacular view. You could see all the way down. Look at our little tiny car down there. It was really cool. But my little daughters wanted to get a really close up view and they started getting close to the edge of the cliff. And as a father, I had to give a law. <laughs> I gave a rule and I say, hey, I'll hold you back here. I'll hold you up. You can look, but I don't want you getting close to the edge. Now, why does a good father give a law in his home? Why did I give that law for Eleanor and Kiara? Is it because I just want to control them? I'm, I'm a control freak. I'm on a power trip with my four-year-old. Uh, is that what this is about? I just want to restrict them. No, it's because I love them. And I know if they get too close, they could get hurt, right? That's why we, get, we have the moral law. It's there so that we can be protected. We could be safe. We could be happy. We could thrive. And I want us to think of the moral law as kind of like you know, think of it as like the, the instruction manual. You know, I, I, I got an iPhone and it comes with an instruction manual. I haven't read the instruction manual, but I'm told these things, electronic devices, they say things like, you know, don't, don't put in temperatures that you'll know, leave it out in the hot sun for too long because it could get broken. Or my favorite one is don't use underwater. <laughs> I mean, you could drop your phone in water and it's protected, but you can't go swimming with your phone, you know? And, 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 and what happens if I just said, hey, Apple, who are you to tell me what to do with my phone? This is my phone. Don't impose your views of iPhones on me. And I go scuba diving with my iPhone. Am I free to do that? Absolutely. 
but I'll end up destroying the phone in the process. And the same is true with God. You see, think of God as the divine manufacturer. He made us. He knows how we work. He knows if we do certain things with our life, we're going to be happy. We're going to thrive. But he knows if we do other things with our life, we're going to hurt ourselves and hurt other people. So that's why God gives us the moral law. The law flows from his love. The rule flows from the relationship. The problem is from the very beginning of the fall, the devil always wants us to separate the law from the love. He just wants you to look at the law and just go, does that make sense? That seems restrictive. That's keeping you from something. That's what he said in the garden. That's what he said to Adam, right? Did God really say, oh, you're not going to die. He's trying to keep you from something. You'll become like him. And that's, the, that's what the secular world is saying, that these are just random rules from your religion. This has nothing to do with happiness, has nothing to do with love. Do not buy into that lie of the devil. It's the devil who wants you to think that this world has no meaning at all. It's just utter chaos and everyone just does whatever they want, will to power. Uh, that's what the devil wants you to believe. But I know that our God is a loving father and he, he loves us so much. He gave us a plan and that plan is for our good and for our happiness. If we want deep peace and meaning and purpose in life, we have to follow God's plan. It's when I separate myself from that. I separate the law from the love, the rule from the relationship that I'm going to be in a lot of trouble for myself. I'm not going to understand the Catholic church's teachings on anything. Now, with that, there's so many more things I'd love to get into, but I want to make sure we have time for some interactions, some uh, questions and answers. And uh, I cover these themes more in, in my book here, uh, Love Unveiled, The Catholic Faith Explained. There's one more book I'll mention as well on this topic called Who Am I to Judge? This one is with Ignatius Press. That's very much just on this topic of, of, of relativism. How do we talk about morality in a relativistic age? Uh, how do I talk about moral truth, a truth that's true for everyone in a world that's going to say, you're, you're a bigot, you're a fundamentalist, or you're intolerant if you think that there's truth that's true for everyone? How do we talk about morality in a loving, winsome way? That's what this one's about. All right, I'll open it up to, to questions, and looking forward to getting to know you all a little bit. Right, so, yeah, so uh, on your Zoom call, you will have a raising your hand function or a thumbs up function. If you use either of those, I'll know you have a question and then I will uh, introduce you and you can ask your question. We also have the chat box if you want to type your messages in there. And we have a few people on Facebook Live. So uh, we'll share those messages, uh, those questions with me uh, through Adam and Adele. So does anyone have any questions? Well, just to get started, um, so you're talking about like love and, and law and uh, how, how does, um, how do we like, so we, we know that we have to approach the secular world by t talking about this love. So how would we start um, talking to someone who thinks of love as the love is some, how you get something to, to bring them to the understanding that love is about something you give away? Have you got any mm. tips on that? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't have the book right here. I would hold it up here because uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to certain books where you can get more. Um, but probably one of my best known books is uh, on this whole topic of love itself. It's called Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love. Men, Women. Oh, there we go. So Amy is holding it up here. Uh, Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love. And that book, what I do, and it's not my ideas, it's just John Paul II's wonderful teachings from Love and Responsibility, a book he wrote when he was a young chaplain working with young people. But he really shows, and he's not drawing from scripture so much and the Catholic magisterial teachings. He's just drawing from people's own experiences of being in relationships and them not working out and why. That he's drawing from his own uh, experience of, you know, being working with these young people and the, the roadblocks they came into in relationships because they had the false view of love. And I think that's a great way to go with this. I think that's a amazing way to go because what it does is you're not, you're, again, you're not coming at it from a faith perspective. You're just drawing on your own experience. I, I will say this talk, I've done pieces of this talk, like that whole section on love. I've done this in front of people that are not devout Christians. Uh, so people who, you know, but, but it speaks to their experience. In other words, like they, they know that they've been in relationships, but they sense the other person is only in it. They're not really committed to me. 
that they're really, they're in it more for what they get out of me. And I thought this person loved me. I thought they really cared about me, but the, the true colors came out when it, you know, it became clear they, weren't, they were just interested in whatever they got out, the fun times, the pleasure, whatever, and they turned to someone else to get that. And, and so deep down, I think our own experience knows we were made, we were made for authentic love. We were made to be known for who we are, loved for who we are. We were made for a lasting love. And that's universal. That's every human person, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, atheist, whatever. Every human person is made for that. And when we can talk in these principles about, you know, just even highlighting the two views of love, I, have, I don't think I've ever had anyone disagree and come up with to me and say, uh, no, I think love is just about what I get out of a person. You know, I think, I think a lot of people kind of can recognize I've been hurt by the culture's view of love. Now, there are some crass men in particular that might just be, oh, I just want to use women. And so they don't care. But I'm saying like, you know, good men, of, men and women of goodwill, they all know that the, the culture's view of love, once you point it out to them, they make the connections themselves. Thank you very much. Um, so we have two questions here, one from Helena Burnett. Do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. I hear you. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Very um, very up, very high, good, good quality talk. Um, and uh, we're talking about secular influences in um, understanding of relationships and the capacity to love. And um, I want to know what your opinion is of um, a, a major secular tool used to form relationships, and that's Tinder. I'd just like to hear your opinion about Tinder. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to swipe the wrong way on that one. That, that, that's what I would do. There you go. Yeah, here's the problem with Tinder, right? I mean, now don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not in principle opposed to like online dating things. I, I have friends that have found their a great Catholic woman and got married, you know, through through an online Catholic dating thing. So it, it does, it can, it can serve some good. The thing about Tinder is it's a little bit more intense. You know, it is just, you're, you're looking at pictures and you're swiping one way or another. And I immediately, I'm, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm reducing this person just to their looks just to their physical appearance. And then it makes the person, and most often even the woman, especially, but the men too, like what matters most, it's appearance. So it's how I, what kind of picture I take and, you know, and, and how I look in that picture and, you know, and, and, and that's so superficial. Uh, but I, but I'm, re I'm, I'm reducing other persons who are, should be my brothers and sisters in humanity, brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, I, I'm reducing them to like products. I'm commercializing them. It's like I'm. It's just like I'm on Amazon. I decide, oh, I don't want that product. I want this product. Oh, I don't want that song. I want this song. I mean, I I, I treat them like an object, like a product. Uh, so I, I think like something like Tinder just gets you know. And, and there's risks that the online dating services could go in that way. Tinder just makes it like that makes it central. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Thanks for that. Uh, another question from Albert Chow. Albert, you there? Good morning. Albert's here. Um, just wondering, that book that you, you talked about, Love Un Unveiled, is there a study or a series of video that we can use for smell group discussions? Uh, I would say two things. First, the book itself comes with, um, with uh, questions that you can use for a small group study. So there have been young adults and married couples around the world doing lots of like small groups with it because it comes right with questions. So you read the chapter and then you can come together and, uh, and, and do the study together that way. As far as videos go, if you go to my website, uh, which is just my name, I'll put it in the chat here, edwardsri.com. So just my name, edwardsri.com. I don't sell things on my website. I just got a bunch of free stuff there, free articles. My podcast is listed there, and, but I also have my, uh, a number of videos that are all for free. And I have a number of talks related to this theme. So it's not so much of a series, uh, although I, I, I think I'm going to be working on a series on this book. Uh, but there are a number of videos there if you wanted a video component. There certainly is one talk that's on there that's like a good hour-long talk where it's a big overview of the whole book. There's certainly that. And then you'll see shorter videos about different themes in that. Um, but stay tuned over the next year. I, I think I'm going to have a series on there soon. So. 
Well, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here from Leonora and Aaron. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yep. Thanks, um, thanks Edward. Sorry, you can hear my son in the background. Um, oh, I don't apologize. Um, related to explaining love to um, my non-Christian friends. So I have a bunch of um, beautiful, um, uh, educated, um, successful female friends who are all single, who are non-Christian. Um, and when I had a conversation with them about the one word that I would use to describe love, I used the word service. And they were extremely offended by that, um, especially in our feminist society where, you know, um, women are seeking to be served by men because when they hear the word service, they think they need to be in the kitchen or, you know, doing the chores and they shouldn't be serving men. How do I explain service and love in an eloquent way to my non-Christian, very educated, successful female friends? <laughs> hmm. Well, maybe avoid the word service if it's a, in other words, like, I don't think it's wrong to say service, but if that's like a trigger word for them, then, you know, uh, beat them where they're at and avoid that word that's going to trigger them uh, in this way. Um, but I, I mean, if, so if they sound like they're very educated and all, you know, I would, I would talk about just, you know, again, I, I have a, a lot more in that other book that they, they have a whole chapter about like Aristotle and the definition of friendship and things like that. So I, I'll go quickly here, but in my book, men, women, the mystery of love, the first several chapters would be really helpful for you because it'll give you a deeper, sophisticated kind of, you know, explanation of love. And you could say, Hey, have you ever, I mean, have you ever studied what like great thinkers in the history of the world have said about love? And they probably say no, <laughs> you know, and you can say, can I tell you about, I'm going to tell you about somebody who's not Christian, just uh, someone that's influenced, you know, one of the greatest thinkers of the world everyone recognizes is a man named Aristotle. And here's what he says about like friendship. And then, and, and Aristotle doesn't use the word service. So that could help you too. Um, but he does talk about that true virtuous friendship is about seeking the good of the other person. Like it's two friends that are seeking a good outside of themselves. Like what, like the good life together. So it's other centered. Maybe, maybe your friends would be more impressed by the word other centered. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but, but then they could, and feel free to quote Aquinas. You know, there's many secular people that quote Aquinas, that, you know, they don't believe his theology, but this isn't theology. He's just giving a philosophical, just using reason. Like what is love? And the essence of love is to, to will the good of the other person, to seek what's best for someone else. Maybe, I, and then you can maybe go experientially. Tell me someone that really loved you, like maybe growing up, maybe your favorite grandparent, maybe you had a, a, an aunt, you know, or you tell, like, like think about a family member, like someone, and, and it's sad because a lot of people maybe haven't had good family experiences in our culture, but if they did, and they think about that, that grandparent maybe that loved them, like it was selfless. It was like they were so concerned and giving and involved. You know, like you try to draw out an experience like from their own life. Like what what was it that you were really loved? I think that that's helpful. But I the last thing I would say is going back to what I alluded to earlier. Every human person deeply desires to be loved in the authentic level of love. I, I long for someone that isn't just getting something out of me. I long for someone that's committed to me for who I am. They know me. They see something beautiful in me, not my looks, not what I, how successful I am, but just something in my character and my soul. And, and they, and they're committed to me. They're not just in it for what they get out of me. I, I think everyone deep down will resonate with that. Very good. Thank you for that. So we've got a few more questions in the chat. Um, one from Marina. I'm going to say, I hope I get the name right. Um, she's, but uh, what is the Catholic Church's view on attending a gay couple's wedding who happen to be a good family friend? Oh, these are so hard. I, uh, I'm, I, 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 these are really challenging circumstances here. Uh, I would say that a lot of it too. I, my, my, I'm going to give you the best advice is you need to find a really good pastor. Like talk to somebody. That, that you can walk through, because there's so many nuances in all these situations. Talk to someone that you know is totally faithful to the church and has a, you know, and, and, and has a good pastor's heart that, you know, we believe in the truth, but we're going to try to 
share that truth in the most charitable, merciful, compassionate way, winsome way, but we're not going to waver on the truth. So if you, you can think of a, a pastor you know that you can talk to about it because you can work out all the details with them. Uh, I think it, this, is, this is challenging because the, it, it, it's not a wedding. I mean, it's not. I mean, they, they may call it a wedding. It may be a, a, a celebration, but in the, in the Catholic theology of matrimony, like this is not, it, it's not marriage according to what God had intended. And so that's what, that's what makes it hard, you know? So, uh, you know, to, to, to be there, you, I, I would want to do all I could if this is a family friend, you know, we're, we're called to love those people. You know, Pope Francis emphasizes this, that people that are living this lifestyle, we're called to love them, to pray with them, to accompany them, to spend time with them. So we really need to do that. That's not just like an extra, oh yeah, I'd be nice to them. No, no. As Christians, we need to witness the love of Jesus Christ for people that might not be living according to what Jesus teaches about marriage. They still have dignity no matter what lifestyle they're living. They still are true, truly made in the image and likeness of God and have tremendous value no matter what their lifestyle is. And so we need to go out of our way and honor that because that there is goodness in them. And there may be even be some elements of goodness that they really care about this other person and all that. We, don't, we, we, we can't like just say the whole thing's out. Nevertheless, it is a, uh, a great challenge because it is not marriage. And so you're attending it. Does it, I see someone writes, does it cause scandal? Well, there's that, but just, are you, are you supporting something that's so fundamentally uh, opposed to what Jesus teaches about authentic love and marriage? So this is the second half of Pope Francis. Pope Francis says we have to love them, be friends with them, pray with them, accompany them, and we have to show them a better way. So I want to stand with Pope Francis because there's two extremes out there. One extreme just says, oh, just go to the wedding. It doesn't matter. And you know, anyone can do whatever they want. The other extreme is that, you know, you, you just say, this is, these are horrible people and you just got to just not have anything to do with them. Neither of those approaches are Catholic. Catholic balance is truth and mercy together, together. We never, fo uh, we never fall away from the truth. Uh, but we're always going to go out of our way to love and to, to welcome uh, and, and respect uh, the people of all different backgrounds. Uh, so I'll say this in my own life. When I've been in opportunities to meet with people of, uh, 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 you know, a, a gay couple, a lesbian couple, if once I, I usually don't start off with the theology and here's three reasons why this is wrong. I want them to know that I really I could be friends with them that I, you know, I don't hate them, you know, and I, I, and I respect them and I could hang out with them. I can get to know them, you know, I, and I, I take a real interest in their life. And I want them to know. And I remember many times I go in this or times when this has happened. If I say something like, I respect, I respect you. I respect your dignity as a human person. I disagree. And I'll say in the same breath, I disagree with the choices you've made and the lifestyle, but we can still have a conversation. And I just find that like, if they know that and they really sense I authentically, I'm not, I'm not just saying this, I really mean it. I really can take an interest in their life and I could love them in the true sense of the word to seek what's best for them. But I'm gonna hold on to truth as well. I find like I, I can actually begin to have a genuine conversation. It's when we compromise either one of those, when I just say, you know, I don't wanna talk to you or on the other end, I don't wanna ever talk about truth that I'm not being genuine with them. Uh, I want to love them in the true sense of the word, which is to will the good of the other. I respect him. I'm going to pray with them. And with Pope Francis, I say, I want to show them a better way. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got another, we've got about five minutes left. So we've got uh, another question here. How do we explain to children of single parents that want to date someone other than their other parent? Oh, like the parent, like how do you yeah, explain, explain the children that the, not dating someone else other than their dad? Yeah. Explain that to children. Uh, I wish my wife were here right now. My wife has a little kind of, her main ministry is raising our eight children. So that's her full-time work. But she has a side ministry in, um, with, uh, related to this, it's not exactly this, but uh, with children of divorce. She herself is an adult child of divorce and 
she openly talks about how much like that affects you. And and because we lived in the 70s and 80s and 90s, everyone said, oh, this doesn't affect you. It's not a big deal. Children are resilient. And that's just a lie. That is just a lie. It's not true. And all the psychology and sociology is showing how devastating that is for children. Um, and, and God can work with it. God can bring healing. And that's what she wants to do. She wants to bring hope to find real healing and not ignore the problem, but find hope there. So this is related in the sense that, um, you know, that, when you have a, a you know, your, your mom and you know, there's this dad, dad, your real dad's over here, but mom wants to date someone else. It just causes a lot of heart heartache for, for the child. It's hard for them to understand. Um, and so I, I don't know, you can't run around it. You know, and I don't know how old the child is too. I mean, when it's a little girl, how come much you can explain, but if they're older, I would want to just be able to have an honest conversation and to say, look, here's what happened. I made a mistake when I was younger, you know, and I shouldn't have been with this guy, but I know that God gave me you as a great gift and I love you. And so the, the child needs to know how, how loved they are by this parent. And I don't know if the, if the other parent is involved or not, but that, that's a whole, I mean, that's where it's, it gets all complicated. It depends on that. But, but I, but to be honest and just say, but, you know, so I, I but I do hope to be married someday and I want to, you know, I want to be able to, you know, have a, a lasting marriage. I want you to be a part of that. So and I would just don't underestimate how, and I, I think the person that's asking this question, uh, it tells me you have a really good sensitive heart because there's a lot of people that don't even think about this. They just say, oh, the kids will be fine. So the fact that you're asking the question, I just want to honor you. Looks like your name is Elizabeth, maybe, um, for just being really open to asking that question. Uh, and I would really pray, pray about it. Uh, and pray, how can I best help my children to, to navigate through this? So you're not doing anything wrong, you know, by doing this, but know that it does, it will affect the child and, and to, as much as you can bring them into it uh, so that they feel secure in your love and the potential love of this other, other person. So. Okay. Well, we're coming to the hour mark. So um, just want to thank you so much for uh taking this time out of your Friday evening to spend time with us, uh, Dr. Shri. It's uh, oh. always a pleasure. Um, and uh, we had so many more amazing questions. Um, is there some way that they can ask these questions to you um, online yeah. somewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a couple of things. First of all, you can you know, go to my website, as I mentioned, Edward Sri, edwardsri.com. A lot of free resources there, like I said, free articles free videos, feel free to share them with other people. It's all fine. I just want to get good stuff out there. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. In fact, before we leave, I want to get a picture of all of you. So get you start getting your pictures up because I'm going to post a picture of everybody praying for you. I always have my followers are prayer warriors. So I'll tell them to pray for all of you uh, around the around the world. They'll pray for your conference. But I put in the I put in my in the show note or in the show notes, the 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 chat, the group chat here. Uh, I, I have a weekly podcast. So you can follow me there. So it comes out every Tuesday here in the States. That'll be Wednesday for you all. Uh, it's called All Things Catholic with Edwards Three. So you can find it on Apple Podcasts. If you pulled out your phone to Apple's podcast or Spotify or Google Play, whatever you use, um, you can find it there. But I'm going to give you a warning. I always, because this has happened a number of times. People will search for me and they only put my last name, S-R-I, and they don't find me. You know what they find? They find an Indian Hindu guru. I'm not, I'm not the Indian Hindu guru guy. You want to find Edward SRI on my weekly podcast. You can listen there. Um, so that comes out every week. But, um, but to reach out to me, feel free. You just uh, send me a message on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Or you can send, out, send a message to me on my, on my website as well. All right. I see you got the pictures up. So we're going to – here we go. Oh, there we go. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Everybody waving? All right. <laughs> so, hey, I just noticed I got a text message here. Can you pray for something? This is really cool. Um, my, my children, my teenage children are running a competition. Uh, they, they, we call it cross country. It's like a 5K. So they're, they're, they're trying to get to the state, the state championship. And I, saw, I found out. My son is going to state and my daughter, Teresa, is running right now. So if you can pray for Teresa and Paul, 
Uh, I appreciate it. They'll get a big kick that people in New Zealand are going to be praying for their running. And I'll pray that I can make it out to see you all in New Zealand someday. It would be a great blessing to see your wonderful, I've seen pictures, the beautiful country you have. But even more than that, I see beautiful faith, uh, which gives great hope for a very secular culture uh, that all of you are there. So thanks so much for having me. And I'll, I'll keep praying for you Evangelion ministry. Anything I could do for all of you, you know, moving forward in what you're doing, I'd be thrilled to do another Facebook Live or something else again someday. So. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And for everyone else listening, we still have a whole day of talks left and the uh, talks are available till uh, Sunday midnight. So we have three live, two more live talks. We've got uh, Brendan Malone at 2 p.m. We've got Matthew Taig at 8 p.m. Both amazing speakers. So they're the live talks. Everything else is uh, pre-recorded and is available for you to watch at your leisure. So please enjoy that. Thank you again for all those with the watch parties. Keep engaging with us on the Facebook page and check us out on evangelion.co.nz for any more information. So um, see you all at uh, two o'clock. God bless.